It's a lovely day in August 2012. It's a great day to be here with my Hawaiian shirt and several friends. Okay, we're out in front of the cathedral. On my left is the ent entrance to the museum that's actually situated in the ruins of the original churches. So they did the excavation, and all this area of paving stones that's the square around the cathedral, when they went down, it was all graves because people were buried in the churchyard. So there were ancient graves uh, all through here, and they just covered them up. It is a pretty cool museum because, as I say, it's the original walls of the old churches. Here above me on the left are two empty niches which would have held statues of saints. And these are what the reformers considered idols, obviously, because they were removed and broken. Now, behind me you see the south portico of the cathedral. The guidebooks call it surprising because, as you can see, it is not Gothic architecture, it's Greco-Roman. It's the only cathedral in Europe that has a Greco-Roman portico glued to it. This happened in the 18th century, and it's not surprising at all if you know what was happening in the spirit in the church in the 18th century. At that time, the, um, the fire had gone out from the Reformation. The seminary had been taken captive, and you could study to be a pastor for three years in Calvin's Protestant church in the 18th century and not study the Bible at all. When you learned Hebrew, you had to read a few Psalms. Otherwise, you never studied the Bible. What you studied were Greek and Roman philosophies. So when other gods are worshipped, they want more worship, and they they want visible worship. So this is why we can see what's going on in the spirit in a city if we're sensitive to the symbols involved. It's what John Dawson calls exegeting a city. So when those philosophers were read, the theology of the church became a mixture of Christian tradition and Greco-Roman philosophy. And then the architecture of the church was changed to reflect that mix. Christian tradition with the Greco-Roman part on this end. One of our speakers, Dr. Glenn Martin, used to say that Gothic is so vertical, it takes your eyes up to heaven in worship. Greco-Roman is like the Greek gods. They're half divine and half human, like Hercules was. So it's, they start to take you up to heaven, but then they bring you back down, just like they're gods, half divine and half human. Now, in the early 20th century, the city council commissioned a sculpture of Jeremiah weeping. It wasn't the church's decision, it was the city council decision. And it was a disciple of Rodin who did the statue. And it's right here, opposite the south portico of the cathedral. And Jeremiah has his head turned away and he's weeping. And it's like a testimony of the heart of God in bronze, of his weeping over the state of the church in Geneva. When we had the memorial service here for the Swiss Air flight that crashed off Newfoundland several years ago, it was the national mourning service. So of course there was an imam, a rabbi, a pastor, and a priest. The Protestant pastor was pastor of the cathedral here, and her part was the prayer. And she prayed a prayer to the stars as her part in the national memorial service. Because that pretty well sums up the message of the Church of Geneva today. So they recently remodeled the building where Jeremiah was, and I was watching to see if they would put Jeremiah back there in the same attitude of turning away and weeping over the church of Geneva. And they did. They put him right back in his spot. The Lord is faithful. Okay, let's go on. Okay, we're here right near the Place du Bois de Four. It's the, where the Roman Forum of the city was, so the original Roman marketplace would have been here. As this, it was actually a very tiny place in Roman times. Um, but as it grew, that's when the market moved down to the Place du Moulin, where we started out our tour. 
Um, behind me you see a row of 16th century houses and the reason we're looking at them is that if you examine the architecture you see that on several of them the top story is a different type of architecture. It's not just the traditional top story, it's a different type. It was added at a later time. And the reason for this was that these families wanted to welcome refugees. But Geneva was so small before the Treaty of Vienna that there was no place to build any more buildings. So they added a, a story onto their houses to be able to welcome a refugee family. So for some reason, all the houses in Europe stopped at that level. But these then became the tallest residential buildings on the continent because of the desire to welcome refugees. A French um, non-Christian sociologist has traced the prosperity of a nation. One of the things that will lift the prosperity of any nation is its welcome of refugees. And I'm sure that that's one of the reasons for the ongoing prosperity of the United States is that we continue to welcome more refugees every year than all the other nations of the world combined. So there is a, a measure of blessing on the nation because of that. Okay, we're heading down the hill. Okay, we're here in the in the street Etienne Dumont. It's, as you can see, it's right up from the, where we just were at the Place du Bourg de Fou, the old Roman Forum. And we're stopped here in front of the house where the printer of Voltaire set up shop. Um, Voltaire had a lifelong argument with Rousseau over the debate really between what we call reason and revelation. And in the one of the in a one of the Geneva museums here, there's a book where Voltaire got a copy of what Rousseau wrote and then went through the book and scribbled on every page. No, wrong, what an idiot. All this kind of stuff on practically every page of the book. And as we said, Rousseau was all about knowing through intuition, experience, very big on feeling. We used to say in the 60s, in my generation, if it feels good, do it. Well, Rousseau was one of the first ones to organize his life around that principle. We didn't invent it in the 1960s. So, um, Voltaire was the prophet of the whole age of reason, what we call the Enlightenment, modernism. And post-modernity is the reaction to that 18th century way of knowing. But as I mentioned, Rousseau is the godfather of post-modernity. He was always already saying these things and arguing with Voltaire about them right there. So we have, it's no coincidence that we have on the same little hilltop, Calvin being born, his team forging that mantle of apostolic authority, Rousseau being born, picking up that mantle in the early 18th century, Voltaire moving here from Paris, because he couldn't go back, and all the editions of his encyclopedia were printed here, starting with the second edition. He taught the nations that the way of knowing was through reason, through logic, through science, through building reasonable institutions. And this is what Rousseau was reacting against. Now, when postmodernity came in, most people date it at, at 1989, through the 90s, we were having the same questions. How do we know? How do we know we know? What is reality? And the most popular television show in the 1990s was X-Files. It ran for nine years. The creator of it said it's all about epistemology. In other words, the science of knowing. And the debate every week was between the scientist, Scully, the medically trained doctor who had a reasonable explanation for everything, and the Mulder, the FBI guy, who believed in the supernatural, in extraterrestrial beings, and they had this ongoing argument every week for nine years that the entire world watched. This show was translated even into Asia because those were the questions we were asking. How do we know what's out there and how do we know that we know? Of course, the Greeks <coughs> came up with this debate first, as they did with everything. But we find a clear little example of it, a beautiful example in the Bible in John chapter 12, where Jesus is praying and at the end of his prayer, he says, Father, glorify your name. And a voice comes out of heaven and says this, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the, the text says, I believe it's John 12, 29, 
the crowd said it thundered. In other words, the majority of the of the group that was there were influenced by that Greek thinking, and they had a rational scientific explanation for it. Oh, did you hear that rumble? Oh yeah, it was thunder. It must be going to rain this afternoon. But then there was another group, the verse says. Some said an angel spoke to them. These were like the New Age people today. They knew it was spiritual. They, they got the vibe. Ooh, did you feel that? It was a supernatural thing. But like the New Agers today, they were in total confusion. They didn't know who spoke, and they didn't know what he said. Third group may be composed only of Jesus and John, because John is the only one of the evangelists to record this. They knew who spoke and knew what he said. Now here's the fascinating things, friends. It's the same sound waves coming out of heaven, hitting everyone's ears at approximately the same microsecond. And there are three totally different interpretations of that reality. Not only different, but mutually exclusive. There are different ways of knowing. And those ways are conditioned by our culture. They're taught to us. Let me give you just a little example. I believe that we're still very much influenced by Rousseau and the church. And the way this works out in YWAM meetings is this. Someone's planned a a meeting, a community meeting or whatever. And then what we have in our belief system in YWAM is, if something spontaneous happens, that's the Holy Spirit leading. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, God himself, plans certain things for centuries. It's not that whatever is planned is not spiritual and whatever is spontaneous is, has to be the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a Rousseau thing that anything spontaneous has to be of the Spirit. It doesn't have to be. We can be spontaneously off. We can spontaneously miss the Spirit. I know this from personal experience. The two ways that the world uses to know were both taught from this hilltop. The nations were taught from here in the 18th century. And that debate is still not over. It's not over in the church because we are in total epistemological confusion ourselves. We do not know how to know, even in the church. What's the place of a woman in leadership? There is no agreement in the church. We, we all quote by Bible verses of each other, but we read the Bible verses differently because of what's in our minds, because of the way we have decided to know.